So how do we teach kids to give? Well, they have birthdays, they have little gifts and things, and so we started at a very young age. I, I want to go into a story from Jesus. Jesus was such a great teacher and would talk about what is very obvious, natural, as we would say, in church, but then he will apply it to something that is spiritual. So grab a Bible, grab an iPad, an iPhone, or something, and we're going to Luke's Gospel, chapter number 16. And Jesus is going to tell this story, and watch what he says here. Jesus told this story to his disciples. Look at everybody and say, you're the disciple today. Yeah, so don't look at me. Look at somebody and say, you're the disciple today. He told this story to his disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. So there's the business owner. There's the manager. One day, a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, you're going to get audited. We're going to take a look at what's been going on here. Get your report in order. Get your numbers in order. Get the accounting taken care of. It's interesting that Jesus talked a lot about money and income. He said, get your account in order because, and here's not, a, here's not good news, you're going to be fired. <laughs> you're done. So watch what the guy says. The manager thought to himself, now what am I going to do? My boss He's fired me. I don't have the strength. Here's an honest statement. You know, I don't really want to dig ditches, and I am too proud to beg for money. I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I'm fired. So he says, I got no place to live. Somebody's going to have to let me sleep on their couch. How do I do this? So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He said, now, how much do you owe him? The man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. It didn't make much sense to us. Olive oil was used for lighting. It was used for lots of things. It was used for cooking. So 800 gallons of olive oil is a lot of stuff. It's your power bill. It's your fridge. It's your food. It's everything. So the manager said, okay, take the bill and change it to 400 gallons. How much do you owe my employer? He said, the next man, I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat, was the reply. And the manager says, take and charge it, change it to 800 bushels. The man had the authority to do this. This is done all the time in our culture. Credit companies help individuals lower the amount that they owe. It's done with medical bills. This is done all the time. You owe how much? Okay, we'll take this much. Because companies feel like, credit card companies, other businesses feel like, look, something is better than nothing. So, so this is something done in the 21st century that was also done in the first century. Now, now watch how Jesus will respond to this. The rich man, Jesus, is telling this story. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. Now, the word shrewd, it's not a bad word. It simply means having or showing sharp powers of judgment or being very astute. And then Jesus will make a profound statement. And I don't want us to run over this. He says, these are the words of Jesus. And it really is true that the children of the world those that don't have a relationship with God are shrewder in dealing with the world around them than the children of light. What was he really saying? This is what he was saying. The people of the world understand the use of money better than the people of God. Wow. Now, why would Jesus say something like that? Let me give you a couple of reasons. Number one, individuals inaccurately feel that money is evil. I've seen people put up these, these statements, well, money is evil. Money's not evil. Money is neutral. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of evil. But what makes money evil or what makes money good? So, so here's a couple of $20 bills. 
What makes this money good or bad? Right now, it's just a piece of paper. Okay, it's really not worth $20 because you would add in the inflation and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but whatever it's worth. What makes this valuable or invaluable? It's what you do with it. Money is only evil if it's used for evil purposes. If it's used for good purposes, then it becomes good. If it's used for evil purposes, then it becomes evil. Uh, what's, your, what's your daughter's name? Addison, Addison, come here, sweetheart. So, come here for a minute. How old are you, Addison? Nine. You're nine years old. Ten. You're ten. Okay. You don't know how old you are. Okay. She just had a birthday, didn't she? Yes, she, okay. So, here's what I want you to do. I want you to hold on to this, 20, these, this $40 in your hand. Okay. So, I'm going to give $40 to Addison. Addison, you can go back and sit down. The money's yours. Don't give it back. Don't make your mother give it back. Here, go sit down. It's yours. You, got, you, just, you just got 40 bucks. What makes, I'm serious, I don't want it back. What makes, she's looking at it and say, uh, is he serious? <laughs> is he serious? Yes, I'm serious. Uh, you can go buy lunch for your mother. What makes that money good and what makes that money evil? It's how it is used. So if I take that money and I go buy cocaine, that's an evil use of the money. If, if I give it to a 10-year-old, that's good use of money. And so there are individuals, you know, we've got this idea somehow, and, and Jesus taught a lot on money. Well, money's evil. No, it's not. It's how it's used. Then Jesus we make that statement that the people of the world understand the use of money better than the people of God because there's a lot of people who love Jesus, but they have a poverty mindset. What do you mean by that? Well, I'm not living in poverty. That's not what I'm talking about. Do you realize a person can have a million dollars in the bank and still have a poverty mindset because they feel like they'll never have enough? I just got to have a little bit more. I just got to have a little bit more. I can't give because I got to have a little bit more. And they live in this sense of the lack of the blessing of God. There's never enough. There's never enough. There's never enough. God gives us everything to enjoy. Okay, he does. God gives us stuff to enjoy. Anybody in the room believe that? Okay, um, maybe we, we're going to push the, the, the electric button in some of the seats right now. Could you push that button right now? Okay, okay. Does God give us stuff to enjoy? That's okay. That's good. But some people have this mindset. They've got everything they need, but they're still living in this poverty thinking. And then Jesus wants us to understand that money is to be used to establish his kingdom on earth. On the wall out there, it says, following Jesus with all of our hearts to establish his kingdom on earth. What does that mean? Do you understand that everywhere that we walk, everywhere that we go, we are to be establishing the kingdom? What do you mean? When I walk into Walmart, I don't know how many people know Jesus at Walmart. If you look at the website, people at Walmart, you'll wonder. I don't know how many people love Jesus in a store that I might go into, Food Line, Walmart, wherever it is, but I want to tell you something. In the place you work, in your business, wherever you're at, whether you're the employer or the employee, when you walk into there, if you know Jesus, the whole thing lights up in an unseen realm. And what happens is wherever we go, we are to be establishing the kingdom. Now, we think kingdom is church. That's a very small part of God's kingdom. Because we are to establish the kingdom in government. We are to establish the kingdom in science. We are to establish the kingdom in medicine. We are to establish the kingdom in entertainment. We are to establish the kingdom in media. We have this in our mind, business and, and corporations and everywhere. We have this mindset, well, the kingdom is people coming to pray. That's a small part of God's kingdom because we're only here a short period of time in a weekend. You're out in the world. I'm out in the world. And everywhere I go, I'm being caught more 
conscious of it now than ever. When I walk wherever I go, I'm establishing the kingdom. I'm establishing the kingdom. That is the mind of God, and God wants me to use my resources wherever that is at to establish his will that's always done in heaven to be done here on the earth. That's not God's responsibility. That is mine. So what Jesus is going to do, he tells the story, and then he's going to explain the story. He's going to make statements, and then I'm going to ask some questions. So, so here's the first statement Jesus will make about this. Here's the lesson, okay? Everybody say, here's the lesson. This is Jesus talking, use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. So he tells a natural story. Then he's going to make a spiritual application. Here's the question. Am I using my resources to get people to heaven? The real question is, am I building my kingdom or am I building his? I only have to look at my bank account to determine the answer to that question. Am I using my resources to get people to heaven? Jesus will make another statement and he'll say this. Moreover, and this is in, from the book of Philippians, and now watch this, don't miss this. Moreover, as you Philippians know, Paul's talking here, okay? In the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. Now, now let me pause it here. There's a real misunderstanding about how Paul was supported. There are some people that teach inaccurately, Paul didn't take money from everybody. Well, he told that to the Corinthian church, but most of the places he went to, he was supported by other multiple churches. Sometimes he worked in tent making when he had to, but much of the time he did not. He was supported by multiple churches, and notice what he says here. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid. Paul is talking about the Philippian church. You sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. Now, here's the motivation here. This is the Apostle Paul talking. I don't need your gifts. In other words, he said, and I'll say to you, we don't need your money. Paul says this, what I desire is that more be credited to your account. Account, you mean my credit union account? You mean my Bank of America account? You mean my bank account? That's not what he's talking about. What account's he talking about? The account in heaven. That's what he's saying, that my giving increases the account in heaven. Do you realize that every one of us in this room have an account in heaven? Is that new information? I'll repeat what I said last week, that the only thing that I get to receive when I get to heaven is what I've already sent there before I get there. All of us have an account in heaven. And when we are generous, that account increases in heaven, and it also has a benefit for people here on earth. And Jesus will make this statement. If you're faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. Ooh, this is Jesus talking. Is this too heavy for us today? Do I understand then that little things matter? I was probably eight or ten years old. And there was this store, this clothing store that my, my mom would buy clothes for me at. It was a boys' girl and a girls' store. It was called Lads and Lassies. And so I was in that store one day. And you know how that when you buy socks, there's this little plastic thing that holds the sto- socks together. They, they use them for hanging up the socks. So you can grab the sock off, off the hanger thing, and they, you rip that off, and, and then you buy the socks, and you're good. Well, there was one of those little plastic things laying there, so I grabbed it. It's worth nothing. Probably a, a, a hundredth of a penny. So I got in the car. I still remember this. I was very young. My mother said, where'd you get that? And I said, in the star. And we had already left. She drove that car back around. She said, you take that back inside that store right now. 
Here's my mother who didn't know the Lord that understood if you're faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. It's a lesson that my mother taught me when I was eight years old. If you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. Do I understand? Look at somebody right now and say this. Do you understand? Okay, the room's really quiet today. First service was like this too. I don't know what's the, what the deal is here. Look at somebody right now and say, do you understand? That's a little better. Okay, that little things matter. Then Jesus will make this statement. If you are untrustworthy, he, he, he's, he's, he's pressing on it now, about worldly wealth, money, who's going to trust you with the true riches of heaven? What is he saying? That what I do with the natural determines if I'm entrusted with the supernatural, what will I do? In other words, and, and this is a profound statement. This is Jesus talking. He says, God looks at what we do with what we have in our hands and how we handle it to determine if we are empowered with supernatural gifts and are able to do the impossible deeds that Jesus did. So as we're closing in prayer right now, you're dismissed. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'll talk to those who are watching right now. Those of you that are watching online right now, Jesus made this statement. If you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? Okay, listen to this, folks. What is Jesus saying? We got a world out there that's passionate for what they're doing. He's saying our passion for spiritual things should match their passion for natural things. Do we need to take a think break here? He's going to make this statement. If you're not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? Question, can I see that faithfulness with what is not mine determines what can be mine? I told our school of ministry class, uh, what's your room look like? What's your car look like? Well, I got fuzz growing under my seat from a peanut butter sandwich that's been there for six months. <laughs> mm. Now, I didn't write this. Can I see that faithfulness with what is not mine, when I'm entrusted with something, whether it's what the employer tells me to do, what is given to me, etc., what is not mine determines what can be mine. Now watch this. No one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other. You would, now we always talk, I'm not going to serve God, I'm going to serve the devil. The context of this is money. This is what Jesus is talking about here. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. I'm not enslaved to money. We don't, I don't think anybody uses checkbooks anymore. I don't know. I, I, I write like half a dozen checks a year anymore. But, but your debit card, your credit card, how you pay your bills, etc., how you give. I'm not enslaved to money. Well, just look at it. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Now, in the whole story here, it's not just the disciples that Jesus is talking to. There's a bunch of religious people listening to Jesus teach. And, and watch what happens here. The Pharisees, everybody say the Pharisees, they weren't all bad people, but they were very religious. They were strict. Who dearly loved their money. You say, ah, I don't know, it doesn't apply to me because I don't have a lot of money. Mm, it has nothing to do with that. I, pick, I can be greedy with a dollar. The Pharisees who dearly loved their money heard all of this, and while Jesus is preaching, he said, ah. the word scoff, ah. that's just the preacher trying to get money. <laughs> and 
No, we're trying to get people's account in heaven credited to where it'll matter beyond this life. They scoffed at him. They said in the church service, and they said, ah! <laughs> then he said to them, you like to appear righteous in public. You love to lift your hands and worship God, but God knows your hearts. Whew. What this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. Yikes. Can, can, can you hear the words of Jesus here? how he's going beneath the surface to something that is very practical to where we live. Remember me talking to you about what is known as the 1040 window. It's a part of the world that extends from West Africa to East Asia. From the, it's a rectangular-shaped area, 10 degrees to 40 degrees north of the equator. Four billion people live there, including more than 80% of the world's poorest of the poor. Nearly two billion in the 1040 window have never had the chance to hear the gospel of Jesus, not once. It enc encompasses the majority of the world's Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists. When we talk about unreached people groups, okay, some of these people groups around the world could be millions of people. It's based on uh, ethnicity, it's based on location, it's based on language, it's based on a lot of different things. And there are many, many unreached people groups. Now, there's another group that's called unengaged. The unreached people groups are those individuals where there's maybe somebody working there to share Jesus. They just haven't been able to share Christ yet. Unengaged people groups, there's not even anybody there to tell them about Christ. So when we talk about unreached people groups people that just don't have a relationship with Jesus and haven't heard about Jesus. Okay, that, how many of you know it's a big deal if you haven't heard about Jesus? Okay. So where are the largest unreached people groups around the world? Here they are. India, China, I don't want you to miss this. The third largest mission field now in the world of unreached people is now the United States. Hmm. Did you know this? I, I, I want to show you. I want to show you something that around the world, ninety-four percent of the world knows that logo, Coca-Cola. Only fifty-four percent of the world understands what that is. Why is that? Because Coca-Cola made a financial decision. They said, we're going to expand our product everywhere we possibly can, and we're going to make the appropriate investments to make sure everybody possible knows about Coca-Cola. It was a financial decision. It's a resource decision. It's a leadership decision. And it's in every language around the world. And multiple different flavors of Coca-Cola around the world. Hmm. Look at this. For every $100,000 made by professing Christians, $1. Now, I'm not talking about you making $100,000. If you, if you put a group of people together and their combined income is $100,000, only $1 in America right now, is used to send the gospel to unreached people groups. We either don't see the need of it, maybe we don't understand that God has called us to establish the kingdom right from here in Newton, North Carolina. You see, we're not interested in just reaching Catawba County. We want to do that. We're not even interested in just reaching North Carolina. We want to do that. We're not interested in just reaching North Carolina or the, or the United States of America. We want to do that. We believe that God has called us right from this location to touch the world. 
right from here in Newton, North Carolina. It's just, you know, we're just kind of here in Newton, North Carolina. Yeah. We believe that the resources are right here in Newton to be able to do the impossible to reach the world. Right here. You, you, you believe that's right here? I know it's right here. Because God would not call us to do something if the resources were not available. They have to go from our hand into the hand of the Lord. Some of you have probably seen this. And you've been following what's going on in Canada. Okay? These truckers are amazing. Okay? And let me tell you what they're doing. They're establishing the kingdom. What, what, wait, 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 wait. What do you mean establishing the kingdom? They're just truckers. That's the point. You have these men and women who have given up income, their own income, because they're not hauling, to make a statement to literally a dictatorship, communist type of government. We don't see Canada like that, but that's exactly what it is. We're only a few years behind there without a National Awakening Church. They're singing hymns, they're praying, they're worshiping, and they're establishing the kingdom because they're taking their resources and they are going to a place and sitting there until something supernatural happens in a nation that they want to see God show up in. That's what they're doing. Okay? And, you know... We talk all about the supply chain issues and, and a lot of that uh, uh, just a facade for, for something else to make excuses. Let me tell you something. I'm okay if something's not on the shelf, if they don't deliver it so they can stay there and establish the kingdom. Okay? We've given in multiple areas as a church, we We've given thousands of dollars to get girls out of human trafficking. I talked with an individual at the end of the first service who oversees the issues of human trafficking in this region for law enforcement. And he said, you would not believe what is going on in, right in this area right now. And particularly these three interstates that come together, uh, 40, 85, and 77, and the human trafficking that's right in front of our eyes and we don't even know what's going on, particularly through the Charlotte area. Well, I hope somebody does something about it. Yeah, so does the Lord. We've given thousands of dollars to establish a well, a solar well, to be able to let people in foreign nations have clean water, but the well is established on church property. So when people come to get the water, they don't, they only, they don't only get just natural water, they have the potential to receive living water. Okay, what is that church doing? They're giving out something natural in return that the people coming to get the water can get, get something spiritual. Do you understand what Jesus is trying to tell us here? Okay. Jared, come to the keys for a minute. We've given thousands of dollars to help people pay off their electric bill. And take a look at this. This is going on as I'm speaking right now. There's kids down the hallway because somebody decided to give money to have kids, pastors, workers, resources. Because somebody said, children, kids in a nursery. Somebody said that teenagers matter, so they gave money to make that happen. Can, can we grasp the importance of this? God gives us everything to enjoy, and we should enjoy it. I like going away and chilling. But God also requires me to make a decision about how much I can chill. I can spend it all on the chilling and never think 
about the people that God has called me to reach. You, you, we all have that ability to do that. It's a choice that we make. So, so this is what we did. We, a while back, we said, we're going to establish a place covered over that still has the ability to have some outdoor air through it. It's, a, it's an outside gymnasium. It's pretty large. It's 80 by 130 so that we can not only do basketball, but we can do indoor soccer, volleyball, and other things. You say, okay, how is that the kingdom? How, how, how is that the kingdom? We did an in-depth and in, in, in demographic study. We didn't do it. We ordered it for this whole region. And here's what we discovered. You say, shouldn't you be able to know that through prayer? Um, well, it was quicker to get the demographic study. <laughs> Okay, if you're that spiritual, you tell me all the demographics of ethnicity and money and income and what people want in this area. You know what we found out? In the demographic study for this region, it tells us, it tells us how this region is going to grow in the future, what ethnicity is going to be here, income and everything, families, what they want, what they need. You know one of the things we found out in this, in which it was, I read it and I thought, really? People are asking for places to do recreation. Really? See, there are churches that have these facilities, but you know what? This is what we also discovered. They don't let the community use them. It's only for their own church people. So we said, what are we going to do? You say, well, that's, that's, that's fine. You know, it's... It's not really kingdom-oriented. LJ, I want you to stand up for a minute, and I just want you to explain the discipleship that happens when kids come together in sports teams and things. And, and some of us need to expand our thinking beyond a church service. So I've been coaching for many years, probably 10 years I've been coaching, but for the past five years I've coached high school kids. Um, and I've had opportunity to really cast vision into their lives about their futures and that type of thing. But what I'll tell you is this. Hey, the pause, most... LJ. I need a shot of LJ here, guys. Uh, I don't need to be in the shot. Get LJ in the shot over here. I know it's a little dark, but it's okay. Go ahead. Uh, one of the most uh, influential people in anyone's life is a coach. Uh, I learned that when I was a freshman in high school playing football, I had a coach tell me one time, he said, Johnson, you got to finish as strong as you start. That still rings true with me now, even today, uh, in challenging moments and times, I still remember that coach telling me that. What's been amazing has been the opportunities that we've had to be able to get, and I say we, there's several coaches here in this room, there are people sitting in this building today, um, have been here first, second service, a part of what we're doing here because of the coaches that have invested in those kids' lives. And we get the opportunity to share Jesus with them, but when kids are calling you on the phone and send you a message and saying, Coach, I'm really down. I really don't know what to do. That window of opportunity right there to share Jesus is incredible. They contact you and say they've lost a loved one. They're sad. They don't, they're trying to work through those emotions. They're trying to figure out the next steps in their lives. We are casting vision every time a kid is reaching out to us and we're sharing with them. And these opportunities here give us an opportunity to be able to invest in the next generation and also create a transition opportunity for kids that are still trying to figure out what to do, we have the, the, the window is wide open for us to be able to cast vision and really share Jesus in a way that changes lives forever. That's kingdom, folks. Do we understand that's kingdom? Can I, can I ask that question again? Do we understand that's kingdom? Your job is kingdom. Your occupation is kingdom. The things that we do beyond the four walls of a church, that is kingdom. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's kingdom. So we said, let's, uh, let's see if we can't raise at least $300,000. A project will cost more than that because we have to do multiple things. We said, let's, let's at least try to raise $300,000. So this is where we're at right now. About 17% of people gave to that, and we're at $38,000 right now thankful for that. The plans were submitted for the groundwork for this last week. So it's already going down the track. 
I'm challenging those of us in the room today to say, number one, are you a giver? Do you tithe? We went all over those numbers last week. You know, I don't have a lot of money to give. Okay, let's take a look at this. A person that gives $25 a month for one year, in a year of time, they've given $300 to something. I don't have $300. You do it $25, $25 a month. And, and go down, 50 bucks, 600 75 bucks, 900 Everybody could do something. And if you take the number of people here that give, it's not everybody that goes to church here. There's about 1,000 people that call this church home. But if you give, you talk about those that are actually giving right now, even at 25 bucks a month, if everybody did, that's $174,000. 50 bucks a month, 348 Look, even at 100 bucks a month, it's almost $700,000. You can do a whole lot more in a year's time than you can do one time. I give to kingdom builders. This is, this is what we do. We give to kingdom builders. Why? Because we're building the kingdom. I, I, I want to challenge you today to think kingdom. How many of you believe that by Easter we can make up the difference if we started it today and made commitments to so much per month? I got one kid. Stand up right there, buddy. Stand up. There's the faith of a child right there. Anybody want to believe with this child that by the time Easter rolls around, we can be way down the track with this? Anybody want to believe with that kid right there? With that child right there? Because, listen, 100 years from now, none of you in this room will be alive. Or maybe if you're a baby, you might be. My uncle just passed away. I'm flying out to do his funeral tomorrow. He's 98 years old. Okay, that's, that's really good. My mom, I'm sure you've heard me talk about my mom. She's 95. Okay, she's, still, she's still going. She's driving. She's doing everything. She's sharper in her mind than ever. I pray that when I'm 95, I can still have the mind that my mother has. But it's likely, unless you, I had a great aunt that lived to be 112, so if you're 12 years old in here, you might make it to 112. <laughs> okay. But likely 100 years from now, most of us won't be here. Only what's done for Christ will last beyond my lifetime. Let's make it last, folks. Let's do what we need to do. Be open to the heart of God generous. I pray God will break off from this whole region the spirit of greed and that the spirit of generosity will take hold of the body of Christ in Catawba County. Stand with you. Stand right up with me right now. Now listen. How many of you in the room? Because this is, seems natural. And, and, and look at this. How, how do I do this? How do I do it? Look, I understand that, that some are challenged. Establish a budget. This is in the Bible. Start working to be debt-free. Say, I want to give, but I got a lot of debt. Okay, well, how you get out of debt is start giving and work a plan. We can help you with this. We can show you how to do this. And they're determined to start a giving pattern. That's, that's three simple things. That's natural. Now, let's talk about the spiritual. How many of you in the room today, you need a healing in your body? Put your hands up. Okay? Now, God's going to confirm his word from the natural to the supernatural. Keep your hand up if you need a healing in your body, okay? You guys look around. Look around. Somebody has their hand up right now. Lay your hand on them, and we're going to declare the spiritual because we have been faithful in the natural. Lay your hand on them right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we make a declaration of healing right now. God, we believe that when we are faithful with the natural, you allow us to receive the supernatural. Holy Spirit, I pray by the power of God that cancer will disappear. I pray, God, that those who are in pain and cannot walk, that their legs will find strength, their hip will find strength, and they will get up and walk in Jesus' name. I pray, God, for pain to disappear today. I pray, God, for depression to lift. 
I pray, God, for the fog of life and confusion to be moved aside, that somebody will able to be able to see clearly in this room today. Holy Spirit, we pray for the supernatural power of Jesus. We pray for salvation in this room. If you need Christ, call on his name right now. I say, I need the Lord. I need the Lord today. I need the Lord. And we declare the life of God. That which is dead, we declare it to come back to life. That which is hopeless, we declare hope. That which looks like it will never change, we declare change today. Someone, Lord, that walked into this room under something, I pray, Holy Spirit, right now, may they have an encounter with the presence of God. In the name of Jesus, shift our minds, shift our thinking, shift our bodies, shift our hearts to kingdom-minded thinking. We pray. I pray for the gifts of God to come out of the people that are standing in this room right now. Oh, God, we declare the gifts of the Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit of God, and we declare faith and hope. Look at somebody right now and tell them, I declare faith and hope over your life right now. Tell them right now. And for those of you that are challenged financially, we speak financial blessing over your life right now in the name of Jesus. Just like a 10-year-old girl got 40 bucks today. We pray for jobs. We pray for promotions as you're faithful. We pray for income that goes beyond what you need so that you're able to invest in the kingdom of God. We pray God's grace and strength and favor on your going out and your coming in in Jesus' name. Those of you who are watching, in Jesus' name. Somebody give the Lord praise today. Come on.